Brother Dub McClish doesn't need an introduction. I'm not going to give him much, much of one. His life is an introduction to what's important in life. We appreciate the long years of service. I know we joke with him about his age, but uh, some of us aren't all that far behind him. <laughs> but it's good to know a man who's lived virtually his life serving God. Would to God that we could all say that about so many people. It would make a great deal of difference as to the leavening influence in this world for good. And if more people, and he's not the only one we can say that about, but if more people were like that, certainly it would have made an impact on our world, and especially these United States. I think it's very good that he closes out this lectureship with, about keeping informed, being informed, and keeping informed about church history, current events, and world events impacting the church. One of the things that's been so amazing to me from the time I was a very young preacher, and I think I'll say this for all the preachers, to this present hour, is just how many people will not keep up with what's going on in the Lord's church. And how many of those who call themselves shepherds don't see any need of knowing what's going on across the road, you might say, or next state. Uh, some say, well, that doesn't bother us here. We don't need to be concerned about it. Well, I suggest to you what is a big problem in some church in California or Georgia or Florida or New York or whatever can be right down here roosting on your shoulder the next day. And we seem to think that we should be informed about various other things. But when it comes to the most important cause there is, the cause of Christ and his people and what they're doing, what they're believing, what they're teaching, we don't seem to be too, too concerned about that as a people. And we need to be. So he's going to bring us this final lesson of our lectureship, all of it having to do with how to be faithful once you become a Christian and keeping informed about church history, current events, and events that have to do with the church and impact the church. Brother Dub, come speak to us, please. I think I had the only title that it took a whole page of the book just to print the title. <clears throat> Let me interrupt you. I have given him titles like that before, and that's about the second, third, or fourth, or fifth time. <laughs> That he's probably done those titles. We wouldn't have signed things like that to people if we didn't think they could handle it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice attempt there, but. <clears throat> well, I think this is what, year number 21 for like y'all's lectureships? Maybe the 22nd one. Yeah, 22nd one. 21 books. Uh, those books, of course, are of incalculable value, and some of them are out of print, but they're not out of circulation via the uh, CD. So I would certainly urge you to add that to your library, especially if you didn't get some of the early volumes of the books. I want to begin this afternoon by uh, reading some things that I got on email a while back. You probably got a lot of junk on email, as I do, that you never have a chance to read, and it's probably not worth reading anyway. But once in a while, there's a keeper. And I thought uh, the following few things were keepers. Uh, these are notes that children wrote to God. Dear God, I went to this wedding, and they kissed right in church. Is that okay? <laughs> Neil. <laughs> Dear God, instead of letting people die and having to make new ones, why don't you just keep the ones you got now? <laughs> Jane. <laughs> Dear God, I think the stapler is one of your greatest inventions, Ruth. <laughs> Dear God, in Bible times, did they really talk that fancy? Jennifer. Dear God, I think about you sometimes even when I'm not praying. That was pretty good. Dear God, I'm an American. What are you, Robert? 
Dear God, I bet it is very hard for you to love all of everybody in the whole world. There are only four people in our family, and I can never do it. <laughs> Dear God, put another holiday between Christmas and Easter. There's nothing good in there now. <laughs> And here's Mickey D. Dear God, if you watch in church on Sunday, I'll show you my new shoes. <laughs> Dear God, if we come back uh, as something, please don't let me be Jennifer Horton because I hate her. <laughs> Dear God, maybe Cain and Abel would not kill each other so much if they had their own rooms. It works with my brother and me. <laughs> Now, this one has some real philosophy in it. Dear God, if you give me a genie lamp like Aladdin, I'll give you anything you want, except my money and my chest set. <laughs> <laughs> Dear God, we read that Thomas Edison made light, but in Sunday school they said you did it, so I bet he stole your idea. <laughs> and this is the last one. Dear God, please send Dennis Clark to a different camp this year, Peter. <laughs> I couldn't resist to bringing those today. The uh, kudos and thanksgiving for uh, what you brethren here at Spring do, uh, it's impossible to fully express, but you're worthy of all the expressions that have been made of them, and I certainly add mine to those. I have a uh, very special relationship with the uh, church here, with the elders, and with David. I've had for a number of years now. Uh, they oversee the support that brethren are kind enough to send me to keep my work going. And uh, that, of course, is a major contribution to the work that I try to do. And, of course, the congregation here has a part in that support in addition. But uh, to get to know Ken and Nancy and Buddy and Burnell and Steve and Brenda has uh, been a great joy of mine through the years, and, and I delight in them, and uh, they must never, never turn back from the course that they're on. And, of course, David and Jody have been very special friends and extended great hospitality to me on many occasions. And, when I chose a couple of men to say a few words at LeBond's funeral, David was one of those men. And the Ross who just adopted me, I, uh, I know now I'm family from the way I got treated this year. <laughs> I got the small bowl of cobbler, the other guys got the big bowl. <laughs> and uh, room service is not any better than it was over at the old house. <laughs> But I will say the accommodations are deluxe. And uh, I've enjoyed them so much this week. And uh, I know that uh, Rick and uh, John Rose and Daniel Denham did as well. Well, we must hasten on. 750 years before Jesus' birth, Hosea on behalf of God, denounced Israel's ignorance and its consequence. Hosea 4.6, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee, that thou shalt be no priest to me. Seeing that thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. Ignorance of God's law was their downfall, and it will cause the downfall of any saint or congregation of them in this present day if persisted in. Additionally, one is greatly disadvantaged who has little or no knowledge concerning various matters related to God's word, including the items I've been assigned, church history, current events among brethren, and world history that might uh, affect the Lord's church. 
One is either a spiritual babe and are grossly misguided, and perhaps both, to believe that knowledge of these areas of information is unimportant to one's faithfulness to the Christ. Undeniably, a major factor in the extensive apostasy the church has suffered over the past half century has been that so many brethren have failed to inform themselves in one or more of these fields of study. Since knowledge of these subjects is necessary to attaining and maintaining good spiritual health, we'll do well to briefly consider some causes of the pervasive ignorance of these significant matters. Number one, I list ignorance concerning ignorance. A host of brethren are ignorant of just how ignorant they are. These low information citizens in the kingdom are quite content to remain so. One of the anti-issues back in the 19th century and survived to some extent into the early 20th century was the anti-Bible college issue. It's alleged that there was one uh, old brother in the 19th century who was of that persuasion and he was in the pulpit and he was boasting of uh, his ignorance. He said, I ain't never been to nobody's college nowhere, no how, and furthermore, I ain't never going. I just pray the Lord will make me ignorant and ignorant. <laughs> and someone in the back spoke up and said, poor God, he sure got a job on his hands. <laughs> But that's the way it is with some brethren. They just uh, hope they'll get ignorant and ignorant, I guess, and they're accomplishing that. They've never grasped the importance of the perspective that a knowledge of history and of current events both in and out of the kingdom brings. A second uh, element is apathy. The question, do you know the meaning of apathy, to which the unconcerned hearer replies, no, I don't know and I don't care, is the classic definition of the term, of course. I'm not interested in history. It's boring, or I don't care about the news, or I don't keep up with politics. Not only expresses the attitude of millions of our fellow citizens, and which explains to some degree why we're in the shape we're in in our nation right now, but that of more than a few brethren as well. And then there's an isolationist attitude. A parochial and insular attitude grips many individual saints and entire congregations. They do not know and they are not interested in knowing anything about their brethren across town, in the next town, the next state, or anywhere else. They have no appetite for anything beyond a very narrow, myopic, and unscriptural circle of selfish interests. And then there's plain old laziness. Some are cognizant that knowledge of these matters is significant for their spiritual well-being, but they are just intellectually lazy. They are intellectual couch potatoes when it comes to spiritual issues. And then there's naivete. Vast numbers of brethren in liberal churches may not even be conscious of their liberalism, believing their preacher and elders would never lead them astray. Such naivete takes us back to the problem of general ignorance, to say nothing of ignorance of Bible fundamentals. And some brethren know the truth, but are utterly imperceptive about the malignant consequences and fatal effect of false teachers and error. With their, if I don't know about it, it isn't happening, rationalizations, they run from any discussion of brotherhood problems as they view them. As the late Ira Rye Rice often said, you just can't warn some brethren. And then there's the aversion to controversy. Related to the above, some brethren despise any sort of controversy. If necessary at all, they view it as something of concern only to preachers. Some believe that peace is the apex of attainments among brethren, and they shrink from any sort of controversy or disharmony. The Rodney King philosophy, can't we all just get along, has greatly affected more than a few brethren. Many universities, including those operated by brethren, are offering studies and our degrees in conflict management the last few years, otherwise known as how to excel at compromise. 
one would suspect that many of our brethren have advanced degrees in that field. Moses lamented the apostasy of Israel, he foresaw, <clears throat> as he wrote in Deuteronomy 32, verse 29, Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. So we would wish concerning tens of thousands of the Lord's people. Let us now consider each of these three areas of important information. First, some church history. According to Exodus 1, Moses was born under the executive order of infanticide enacted upon Hebrew baby boys by merciless and cruel Pharaoh in the original version of Planned Parenthood. This order arose at least in part because he apparently failed Egyptian history 101. Now there arose a new king in Egypt who knew not Joseph, verse 8. Pharaoh's murderous edict graphically illustrates the sort of tragedy that can result because of ignorance of history in general. The potential for spiritual tragedy in the wake of ignorance applies with no less force to God's people and their need to know and remember their history, both inspired and uninspired. God knew that Israel needed to maintain knowledge of their history if they would be faithful to him. The ceremony and ritual involved in the initial Passover spared the Hebrews from the God-dispatched destroyer who passed over their houses without harming them. But God decreed the annual Passover observance for Israel in perpetuity as a memorial of his deliverance of them from their bondage, according to Exodus 12 and 24. Its observance each year was a graphic history lesson for Israel. And when they grew lax in observing the Passover, they always apostatized. Jehovah again emphasized the significance of Israel's knowledge of its history. When Israel crossed the Jordan by God's miraculous power, he commanded Joshua to erect a 12-stone monument to be a conversation starter for future generations, teaching them about this signal event, according to Joshua 4, 1 through 8. Both this monument and the Passover observance imply the necessity of their knowing the history to which they were tied and God's part in it. When they forgot their history, they forgot their God. He was intimately bound up in it. The New Testament would contain considerably fewer pages if we stripped it of its quotations from the Old Testament, not to mention the almost countless additional references to historical persons and events from the Old Testament. Paul clearly expected the brethren in his day to read and study and learn those things. For the things written aforetime were written for our learning, Romans 15 verse 4, that we through patience or steadfastness and through comfort of the scriptures might have hope. How much of Matthew, Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews could one begin to understand without some knowledge of Old Testament history? And you can say that to some degree of every New Testament book. Obviously, inspired men understood the need to know inspired history. But church history specifically spans from Pentecost to five minutes ago, and it involves both inspired and uninspired history. Among brethren, the general level of ignorance of inspired history, including both portions of the Bible, is appalling. Our spiritual forebears of only three or four generations ago, generally possessed a hunger and thirst for knowledge of God's word, born of their unquenchable faith in and love for it. This spiritual appetite drove them to study their Bibles seriously. The preachers they heard gave them good, solid spiritual food, unapologetically laden with book, chapter, and verse preaching. As old Israel's ignorance proved destructive to her, so ignorance of the Bible has all but rolled out the red carpet for error in doctrine and practice among our brethren in recent generations, as well as for immorality. Not only is inspired history indispensable, knowledge of uninspired church history can be very helpful in maintaining our faithfulness in the kingdom. <clears throat> 
We need to have at least some acquaintance with the roots of the hundreds of unauthorized doctrines and practices that eventuated in the monstrosity known as Roman Catholicism. We also need to know something of the effort to reform the Catholic Church that began in the 16th century, resulting in zero reformation of that uh, institution, but in the beginning of so-called reform are Protestant churches that have in turn produced the thousands of denominations in our world today. Moreover, we particularly need to know something of the sacrificial efforts of the dedicated men beginning in the late 18th century in our nation who rejected the obviously failed reformation efforts. Brethren need to be familiar with the thrilling account of the fact that these men saw in their study of the New Testament the imperative to reestablish and maintain the church as it began under the inspired administration of the apostles. They pled with others to simply return to the New Testament and to reproduce, restore the church as portrayed in its pages. Familiarity with church history over the past 20 centuries will provide certain definable advantages toward faithfulness. One, it will provide knowledge of the first century church. Surely we need to know that. It will allow one to learn the only means of entering into it, how it was to worship, its authorized organization and work, its designations, its daily behavior as far as its members were concerned. And if we don't learn those things, we've learned nothing at all. This history is the most important of all to learn and appreciate. And if we're not grounded in it and being determined to be guided by it, we'll have no means of detecting, much less opposing the errors that later periods of history reveal. Further, familiarity with the departures that began in the second century and that continue until this moment will enable one to recognize such errors and avoid and reprove them as the unfruitful works of darkness that they are, Ephesians 5 verse 11. And finally, not finally for the speech, finally for the list, mind you, <laughs> knowledge of the efforts to restore the church of Christ, especially over the past two centuries, will permit one to see the way the trailblazing restorers met and defeated such Calvinistic errors as inherited sin, the direct operation of the Holy Spirit. Needs more of that now, don't we, today? Arbitrary election and perseverance of the saints. They will see the way errors concerning worship, such as instrumental music in worship and choirs and infrequent observance of the Lord's Supper and many others. Baptism, faith only and grace only, salvation systems, the pastor system and a host of other errors were met and defeated. They will learn the way that they can meet those same errors today, both in denominationalists and in apostate brethren. It is extremely disheartening that so few brethren know or even have any curiosity about those dedicated men and women who have gone before and who've made great sacrifices of time and talent and what little treasure most of them had in order to advance the cause of pure primitive religion. Their lives and struggles are sources of great inspiration for true disciples, I tell you. I strongly encourage the reading of any of the following one-volume summaries as beginning points for a broad overview of church history. The Church, the Falling Away and the Restoration by J.W. Shepherd, A History of the Church for Busy People by George Klingman. A Concise Account of Church History by John D. Cox. And then The Eternal Kingdom by F.W. Maddox. And then for a more comprehensive history get out the four volumes of The Search for the Ancient Order by Earl West. George Santayana, the American poet philosopher of the previous century, may be best known for the following sage observation. Those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. We could well add as a footnote to Santayana's statement, yes, and those who do not know anything about the past very well cannot remember it. So very many in the church of the Lord know nothing of the departures and apostasies of the past and the scripture refutations of them. And they've fallen prey to repeating those errors. 
I challenge gospel preachers to deliver lessons on these crucial subjects. Preach on church history. Preach on the restoration plea and the history of it and the scriptural principles that were involved in bringing those men and those people out of the darkness of error and denominationalism and thrill to it as you do. But in the second place, we need to be informed about current events in the church universal. That simply means the church everywhere, in case you don't know. Not just here at home. Not just next door. The Lord's church today is definitely not the same body it was 50 to 60 years ago. And the liberals are jumping up and down, down with joy because of that very fact. My grandfather, on my father's side, was an elder in the Lord's Church for about 40 years in a small country church in Burnett County, Texas. My father preached more than 30 years in his preaching work in 1966. If those men were somehow beamed down into a present day assembly of some of the congregations that have Church of Christ on their building, they would think somebody was playing a terrible joke on them or that somebody had put the sign on the wrong building. They would be struck by the gross contradiction between the sign outside and the preaching and practice going on inside. Even into the early 1960s, traveling Christians could enter almost any building bearing a sign that said Church of Christ, confident that they would find scriptural worship and teaching, now, the notable exceptions to that would be in some areas where the Christian church that split off in 1906 retained the designation Church of Christ for their uh, operations. But those whose adult Christian lives have spanned a half century or more are well aware of the changes, the radical changes the Church of the Lord has undergone in many hundreds of congregations, so much so that it cannot be scripturally called the Church of the Lord in many cases. In no corner of the world has the church escaped these changes. I have many times been asked why and how this metamorphosis has happened to a people whose very reason for existence characteristically has been merely to be the New Testament church by adhering to the scriptural pattern for it. These are significant questions that deserve answers. Some brethren admit being uncomfortable with what they see and hear in their congregations, but due to the ignorance already discussed, they cannot quite put their finger on it. Others recognize that they're in a liberal church, but they cannot bear to leave it because of family ties or friendships or a dynamic youth group or whatever. Maybe because no other congregation is in a reasonable or convenient proximity. Thus they stay and they endorse and they encourage and they support financially the apostasy going on. Those who are too young to bridge back 50 years in their experience need to know, number one, that a grievous evolution has occurred. Number two, at least some of the factors that have produced it. And number three, some preventive and our remedial measures for it. Here's some major elements of that evolution. Every movement of apostasy, digression, and departure from the truth since Pentecost has involved either liberalism or antiism. They're just not any other culprits. Liberalism's advocates take liberties with God's word. Cain was the first liberal, at least regarding worship, substituting his chosen offering for that which God authorized. If they were consistent, liberals of our time in despising the Lord's pattern for his church, must sympathize with Cain's behavior and with that of such other noted liberals as Nadab and Abihu and King Saul and King Jeroboam and King Uzziah, and you extend the list, all of whom decided the limitations of God's word were just too stringent. Antiism's advocates restrict liberties and allowances granted by God's word, binding their personal scruples as laws for all. The Pharisees of Jesus' day are exemplars, binding such things as their own Sabbath day restrictions and the washing of hands and of dishes, Matthew 12, Matthew 15, Mark 7, and other passages. If anti-brethren were consistent, they would not only applaud the Pharisees of old, but also the baptized Jews after Pentecost who sought to 
bind circumcision upon Gentile converts, as Acts 15.1 indicates to us. In 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 4, Paul called an anti-doctrines that would forbid marriage and the eating of meat the doctrine of demons. It was antiism, pure and simple. Roman Catholicism demonstrates the effects of mixing both antiism and liberalism with its mass of restrictions that God never made and its contempt for most of the ones he did make concerning his church. While both strains of divergent theology are equally repugnant to our Savior, liberalism seems always to prove the more devastating of the two in the long run. The first wave of liberalism hit the restorers in the mid-19th century with a two-pronged attack. Attack upon the work of the church through the organization of the American Christian Missionary Society, which was organized to do the work that God gave the church to do in preaching the gospel to the world. And then the attack upon the worship of the church by the introduction of mechanical instruments of music into worship, both of them about the mid part of the 19th century. The results of that two-pronged attack took about a half century to work themselves out into a definitive division and parting of the ways between brethren who were determined to have these things and brethren who were determined to resist those innovations. 1906, about 86% of the church went with the liberals. The early anti-issues among the restorers, such as opposition to Bible colleges mentioned earlier, individual communion cups, Bible classes, located preachers, never gained much traction, and only a few very small groups of these folks still remain. However, in the middle part of the 20th century, a few brethren began trumpeting the twin issues of opposition to church support of orphans' homes operated by brethren and of one church's sending funds to another congregation to assist with its work, anti-church cooperation. By the mid-1960s, these brethren created sufficient confusion to attract perhaps 10% of the brotherhood to their anti-views. They have made few, if any, inroads since that time, but have isolated themselves. A new strain of liberalism began to assert itself in the mid-1960s that has proved to be a malignant force of greater proportions than the one that began a century earlier. In perhaps half the time it took its predecessor, it did as much or more damage and it continues its devastation. Rather than distilling their efforts to only two major thrusts, as did their 19th century forebears, Liberals in this latest assault have determined not to separate from the Lord's Church as did their liberal ancestors in 1906. Their strategy is to stay within and bore from within, to reform, restructure, and reshape every facet of the restored church that distinguishes it from every other religious organization. Nothing is sacred to their appetite for change. They call in question the restored worship, the work, the organization, even the plan of salvation. It is a veritable anti-restoration crusade that we face today. To this cadre of dedicated liberals, the denominations are sister churches, which is consistent with their view of the restored church itself as merely another denomination. Summarize the liberal onslaught of the past half century has been characterized by one great principle, abandonment of the need for scriptural authority concerning every doctrine and practice that make the church of the Lord unique among the thousands of counterfeit churches men have built. Moreover, a new breed of liberal has arisen since 2005. These are men who had a record of soundness and faithfulness in the kingdom over many years and with whom many of us worked closely for decades. However, for a variety of motivations, they chose to turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to a prominent brother's impenitent errors regarding eldership and marriage, divorce, and remarriage. This denial of reality caused them to make fellowship compromises plainly forbidden by the Lord and his spokesmen in numerous passages, beginning with the Lord's warning against false teachers in Matthew 7, verse 15. 
continuing to Romans 16, 17, and 18, and Ephesians 5, verse 11, and 2 John, verses 9 through 11, and there are others. Paul's familiar statement of the authority obligation is both concise and clear, and whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now, what are some factors behind this evolution that we have seen and just described? Well, those bent on provoking such changes in recent years have been eager to spread their influence far and wide. All the factors discussed earlier, such as ignorance, apathy, naivete, have contributed significantly to the disastrous evolution. Other elements that have enabled these forces to ravage and savage the bride of Christ so completely in a relatively short time are the following. First, I list determined change agents. As a few began revealing their liberalism in the 1960s and were allowed to retain their pulpits and their professorial lecterns, others in places of leadership were encouraged to come out of their liberal closets. During the 1970s and into the following decade, the number of those dedicated to turning the church upside down and inside out increased greatly, including writers, editors, publishers, elders, and particularly those involved in higher education, which included board members, administrators, and instructors. Preachers such as Lynn Anderson, Rubel Shelley, Marvin Phillips, Rua Lemons, Rich, uh, Rick Ashley, Jeff uh, Walling, and many others abandoned the faith they once preached. With their smooth and fair speech, whereby they beguiled the hearts of the innocent, as Paul describes such men in Romans 16, 18, their iconoclastic efforts to overhaul the church attracted thousands. The second factor has been technological things. Even with primitive means of travel and communication, the first century Judaizers apparently spread their heresy almost to every church outside of Judea proper. You can just trace them on the map by Paul's epistles and his uh, responses to them and refutation of them. Today, modern technology and mobility have made the instantaneous dissemination of information ordinary. These are marvelous tools for preaching and teaching the gospel, but they work just as well for the heretic and his heresies. Those of us who have been privileged to preach the gospel in nations beyond our shores have found that both antiism and liberalism have been amply exported, reaping their bitter harvest in every one of them. A principal reason for our invitations to preach in some of these areas was to confront and refute such errors. Wherever the church exists, Satan will see that the message of change will find its way there, and rapidly so, to infect as many as possible. And a third factor I suggest is the church growth mania. Does any of us not want the church of the Lord to grow? Surely we all do but not just for the sake of growth. In a few years immediately following World War II, the Lord's Church grew numerically so rapidly that for two or three years running, it was the most rapidly growing religious institution in the United States. This growth came largely through personal evangelism and gospel meetings that would fill and overrun buildings such as these for eight solid days sometimes two services a week. I remember some of those meetings back in the late 40s. Because of creeping secularism, it became more difficult in the 1960s to find those who were interested in Bible studies. Gospel meetings ceased to attract the crowds of former years. Accordingly, the growth rate declined. To address this trend, church growth experts sprang up and began making the rounds with their seminars on how to grow a church. And these suggested warmed over denominational methods in many cases. Some churches adopted what appeared to be an almost whatever it takes approach, making them susceptible to various kinds of promotions. This is when the churches started building gymnasiums to attract the people. The circus type performances included such things as uh, bringing in someone to do magic for the master. 
are juggling for Jesus, are gymnastics to the glory of God. Those who offered free hamburgers failed to realize that those thus attracted could as easily be drawn away when the denomination down the street offered a bigger burger. Pride, cronyism, monetary advantage, emotionalism, the fear of being called narrow-minded, and some brethren would rather be shot than be called that, and perhaps other elements played a part. Now what about some preventive and remedial measures? Some of the measures that uh, <clears throat> I'm going to suggest uh, might have some immediate effect, but all of them would have some good effect in the long run, I think. Where apostasy has occurred, some souls may be reclaimed by these measures. You probably guessed the first one, read, study, and learn. Overcome ignorance. Come out of it. Ignorance is the predominant cause that so many have fallen prey to error. Those who are good students of God's word and related matter and whose only desire has been to serve him have been the least likely to be deceived by the servants of Satan. Those with little spiritual appetite have always been the fertile soil for seeds of error. To one who does not know and love the truth, error sounds just as good or even better. Further, those who are wise enough to keep up with the winds of doctrine that are blowing through the church can identify such errors immediately when they encounter them. Those who eschew such information are sitting ducks for errors from suave, dynamic, and personable preachers, professors, and writers. More than ample warnings concerning men, doctrines, publications and schools that have heard from the truth have been documented and issued for more than 40 years, brethren. Our brethren don't have any excuse for not knowing. Truly, there's no dearth of information available, only a dearth of willingness and effort to read and study it. Among those sources, contending for the faith. You're probably surprised that I would mention that begun by the late Ira Y. Rice Jr., has been documenting false teachers and their errors for 44 years. I remember when it was a four-page mimeograph sheet. That's how Ira began it back in the 60s. I got some of the early ones. Now, of course, your own David Brown edits it, and he's doing a spectacular job with it. It's available both in print and in electronic media. The electronic version is free for nothing, no charge. And you can even put somebody else on the list to receive it. And then there's Defender, published by the Bellevue Church in Pensacola, Florida, edited by our dear brother Michael Hatcher. It's in its 42nd year of publication, begun by Brother Bill Klein. It's also available both in print and electronically, no charge for either version. All you have to do is request it. When it became clear that college and university lectureships were compromising the truth, congregations began hosting lectureships in the mid-1970s that would have faithfully preached the truth and that would deal with current errors and issues. Hundreds of books of these lectures have been published that document the history of the church in a unique way over almost a 40-year span. And I'm not using a hyperbole when I say hundreds of books. I have over 200 lectureship books of this kind in my library, and I don't have all of them. Many of these books are still in print or are available on electronic media. I especially recommend the volumes from this lectureship, from the Bellevue lectureships in Pensacola, and from the annual Denton Lectures. I know you're surprised at that. The resources above do not even take into account the inexhaustible supply of information available via Internet. I'm nearly through, David. A third remedial action is to exercise, and I put in the book, local awareness. That might be misleading, though that's what I really meant to say, but let's let's say broad awareness, because that's what I meant to convey by it. Locally, be aware of other things. 
Jesus made it clear that his people must concern themselves with others beyond their own respective locales. As with his charge to the apostles, so to us, beginning at home, our concerns must include others, even under the uttermost parts of the world. Acts 1, verse 8. Paul's concern was about all the churches, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty eight. These interests must include an awareness of the doctrine and practices of other congregations then. Likely thousands of congregations have websites, most of which indicate a doctrinal direction if you do just a little bit of work on them. Only with such information can one then make righteous judgments, as the Lord requires, John 7, 24. Judgments that are necessary for us to make scriptural fellowship decisions in keeping with passages we've noted earlier. And this information will also enable us to warn others of these errors. The congregation that is not troubled with the change agent agenda today may find it on its doorstep tomorrow. The individual Christian, particularly if he is an elder, Acts 20, 28 through 31, who has no interest in such matters is grossly negligent. As with all other potential threats, so with these threats to the body of Christ, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. What about keeping up with world events? It's kind of hard to do. They're going on so fast, isn't it? Some brethren give little or no attention whatever to any world events. Some seem to uh, just be in a frenzy over every world event. In between, there is a place for some balance of being concerned about world events, especially those that might affect the church of the Lord. Scriptural precedent for such awareness and interest abounds in the scriptures. The Lord in the New Testament, Penman, acknowledged that his disciples live in both a material and a spiritual sphere. Jesus called attention to this fact when he said, Render therefore unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God that which is God's. Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. 21. I just have four more paragraphs. <laughs> I just wanted to give you hope. <laughs> We live in a world in which everything associated with Bible and Christian is increasingly under assault worldwide. Lamentably, our nation, though founded by men who accepted the Bible as God's word and incorporated numerous Bible principles into our founding documents, is no exception to this assault. A steady march toward absolute secularism come hedonism has been occurring for half a century. Often encouraged by, as much by our nation's Supreme Court as by the American Civil Liberties Union, which is the legal arm of atheism and humanism. The Supreme Court legalized the murder of infants in 1973, and not content with that, it legalized sodomy in 2003. We're presently cursed with a president whose administration is decidedly anti-Bible and anti-Christian, while sympathizing with all things Muslim. He has issued... Uh, he has used his influence to destroy the biblical definition of marriage. Stipulations in the Obamacare monstrosity will spend money Christians have paid in taxes to fund the murderous practice of abortion. Pressure is intensifying on those who dare to continue upholding Bible doctrine against such abominations as abortion and homosexual behavior. The foregoing are but samples of world events that are already affecting individual Christians and thus the church. It is the height of folly then to wrap oneself in a cocoon of deliberate ignorance of such matters as if they have no bearing on one's life. The Lord did not do so and neither did his apostles or other New Testament writers. While we must never forget that we are not of the world, brethren, we are in the world, and we cannot avoid feeling its impact. The supreme aim of every Christian must be to so live as to remain faithful to Christ and join him in heaven at last. We must be so dedicated to this aim that even the threat of imprisonment or death will not deter us, as the Lord wrote in Revelation 2, verse 10.
This aim will motivate those who are sober-minded to be earnest Bible students, applying the Bible so as to walk ever more fully in the light as he is in the light, 1 John 1, verse 7. It will also motivate us to learn something of church history, of current events and issues among brethren, and of world events that cannot help but affect us. All of this, I think, will help us be stronger in the Lord's cause. Thank you. Just want to make sure you want to start again. <laughs> we can allow a little license, I suppose, there at the end of the last one. Seniority. A lot of seniority. <laughs> but I would have stayed on that more uncomfortable pew if I'd known it was going to go a little longer. That's just... I may scoot that out in the aisle. But, but, uh, I'm sorry, but I can't take it back. Well, you still say you're sorry. That was an excellent lesson, all joking aside. I wish everybody would really think about what was said and, and just order your life to start realizing, you know, we're all we have is our lives. And our lives is what, how we live them is, how, is going to determine whether we go to heaven or hell. That's it. And a whole lot of what we do with our lives depends upon how we view everything around us and what we're here for. And I hope we will take note of all that's going on. I'm afraid many times that as far as the church is concerned, as far as America is concerned, that we have thought, that, well, it's always been this way. It just always will be. You don't have to read much history to know that's just not the case. And the church was restored by men and women who sacrificed greatly to bring us New Testament Christianity. And this nation came into being by people who sacrificed greatly to bring it. Why do we think it can just automatically, either way, stand without any effort whatsoever? So when you think above all of the kingdom of heaven, then it stays in existence because of people who love the truth, who believe the truth, and obey the truth. Remove that, how can you have the kingdom? So let us recognize that, and hopefully what we've tried to do in our little bit here through the book and the messages delivered live and over the Internet and then over our CDs and so forth can at least open some eyes. But I want to close the whole thing by saying let's, let's not get the idea that we're defeated. I don't want anybody to think that. We shouldn't think that. We have God on our side. Now, that's so if you're faithful, and all the Bible says about a member of the church being faithful. And yet we know from the Bible how to be faithful. And as Paul said, if God be for us, who can be against us? Let us measure success as the Bible talks about success, not as the world measures success. And we thank Brother Dub for his years of service and all these men who participated. And there are others, of course. There are 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. Let's keep that in mind. We may not be aware of them. And yet, let us keep our prayers flowing to the Father in heaven according to his will. Build up a greater trust in the truth and its application and the defense of it. And above all, let us have good courage and not be afraid. It just breaks me down to see soldiers in the kingdom of the Lord afraid. That just doesn't fit. If God's for us, what in the world is there to be afraid of? Put on the whole armor of God. Learn how to use it and stand. Nobody can touch your spirit when you're faithful to God. They can destroy your body. They cannot touch your spirit. And someday, when the heavens are split wide open, the Son of Man comes in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them 
that know not God, that obey not the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to punish such people in everlasting fire, then we shall rejoice greatly that we stood the test, that we persevered, and that we kept our faith in the Prince of Peace and the Captain of our salvation. And He'll own us on that day. And I assure you, whatever we faced here will pale into insignificance as the great age of heaven opens and the glory of God magnified permeates all eternity to the defeat of Satan and the death of death itself forevermore. Draw courage and rise up. Let us have an attitude of another, but not in the Bible, but the attitude's there. Who was it that said back in the Revolutionary War, I have not yet begun to fight. And that's just the way I think we ought to feel. How can you be a faithful child of God? Read about Paul. Read about David. Read about Gideon. Well, go read Hebrews 11. See why it's in there. And not have that idea. Let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if ye faint not. I think it's the best place to stop.